and turn with me, if you will, to the Old Testament, to the book of Genesis, chapter 49, beginning at verse 8. We are reading today from the New King James Version, and our entire scripture lesson text can be found on the insert in your bulletin. And I have discovered that one of the uh, sure signs that you've gotten old is that your memory changes. You know that you've gotten old when you can remember things that happened years ago and forget things that happened yesterday or, or last week. Well, I've gotten old. I find myself remembering things from 40, 50, now even 60 years ago, clearer than I can remember things from last week. And I remember an incident that happened in my childhood, and it must have been over 60 years ago. I was 9 or 10 years old. And there was an older boy who lived next door. He was 12 or 13. He was older and much bigger than I was. And he was kind of strange. He, he'd walk around talking to himself sometimes. And you know, you could tell that he walked to the beat of a different drummer. And so, as kids do, my friends and I would tease him and call him weird. And then he would chase us down the alley, and if he caught us, he'd smack us upside the head. So we learned to quit teasing him. But we still thought he was weird, we just didn't say it to his face anymore. And one day I was looking out my window, he lived right next door, and he proved that we were right. Uh, as I looked out into the yard next door, I saw that he had pulled a picnic bench up under a tree, and he climbed up on it. And then he took a rope and wrapped one end around his neck and threw the other end around the tree and tied it up on the tree. Now see, I was back in the 50s, so there were cowboys movies on all the time, and they were always stringing somebody up. So I guess he wanted to experience that for himself. And I was a little devil back then. I could have called for help, but I remember thinking, yeah, if you go, go ahead and do what you're about to do, I don't have to worry about you chasing me about down the alley anymore. So I just sat back and watched the show. But before he could kick the bitch away and hang himself, his aunt, who he lived with, came running and screaming at the house, said, boy, are you crazy? And so she grabbed him, pulled a rope from his neck, and drug him back in the house. And, and she was still screaming at him as she drug him into the house. And I didn't think much about it then. But as I think about it today, I can see there's a moral in that situation. He had gotten himself in such a dangerous situation that if he had, had not, not had someone looking out for him, he'd have been lost. If he had not had someone looking out for him that cared more about him than he cared for himself, he would have been lost. Sometimes we get ourselves in those kinds of situations. And we do it to ourselves, but we sometimes find that we're in such dire straits that all we can do is hold out until help comes. We did not, if we did not have someone watching over us who cared for us more than we care for ourselves, we would surely, surely be lost. And that brings us to our text for the day, Genesis chapter 49, verses 8 through 10. And in this text, you'll hear Jacob speaking to his 12 sons just before he goes to his final rest, just before he dies. And his son Joseph, who had secured sanctuary for the whole family in Egypt so that they could survive the great famine that was in the land, and they were in Egypt now. And so as Jacob goes through the strengths and weaknesses of all his sons, you would have thought that Joseph the hero who had saved the entire family would have gotten the greatest praise. But Jacob laid the greatest prophecy on his son Judah. And let's took, take a look and see why that happened. Turn with me, if you will, to the Old Testament book of Genesis chapter 49, beginning at verse 8. Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whip. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down. He lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who shall rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people. Pray with me this morning as we examine this text with this thought in mind. Hold on till Shiloh comes. Hold on till Shiloh comes. Let us pray. Our Father and our God in heaven, we thank you once again for the privilege and opportunity of standing before these thy people. And Lord, we pray now that the words of my mouth and that the meditation of all our hearts will be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Let the redeemed of the Lord say, Amen. Jacob declared prophetically that Judah would rule until Shiloh comes. But what does Shiloh mean? What does that mean? 
Well, I didn't know. So I looked it up. You, you see churches all over town called Shallow Baptist, Shallow Church of God in Christ, Shallow Methodist. What does shallow mean? Well, since I didn't know, I had looked it up. And shallow means the Messiah, the sent one, or the coming one. So in English, it means Christ. Shallow is none other than Jesus Christ. So once again, we get a glimpse of Jesus in the Old Testament as Jacob makes this great prophecy concerning the coming of Shiloh. Now, the fulfillment of the prophecy concerning Judah began when David assumed the throne as king of Israel. And as Jacob predicted, there was a king from the line of David on the throne of Judah until they were carried away in Babylon in 586 B.C. But because of their disobedience, God allowed them to be taken away at that time. They were taken into captivity, their temple was destroyed, and the throne of Judah was no more. They had put the noose around their own necks, and it seemed like God had allowed them to hang themselves. But there was only one problem. Shiloh had not yet come. That meant that the history of Judah was not complete at that time. So 70 years after being in captivity, Judah came out of captivity, returned to Jerusalem, and rebuilt the temple. Now they were just waiting for the coming of Messiah. They were just waiting for Shiloh to come. 400 years later, Jesus was born, and the prophecy was fulfilled. None of the great world powers, neither Alexander the Great nor the Roman Empire, could destroy Israel before that prophecy was fulfilled. When Christ was born, those in Israel who recognized him could rejoice because Shiloh had come. Israel had to hold on till Shiloh came. But we also need to hold on till Shiloh comes. We need to hold on till Shiloh comes. But why is the story of Israel and their Messiah important to you and I as we sit here 2,000 years later? For what reason will we still be waiting for Shiloh since he has already come 2,000 years ago? Well, in our text, we find three reasons why we should hold on until Shiloh comes. And let's look at them one at a time. In verse 8, it says, Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. We need to hold on because Shiloh is coming to receive our praise. Shiloh is coming to receive our praise. Jacob was declaring that all of his sons would praise the sons of Judah. But in a greater sense, he was making a prophecy concerning the coming Messiah who would come from the tribe of Judah. The children of God will praise the coming Messiah. That is where we come in. The Bible says those who receive Jesus are the children of God. John chapter 1 verse 12 says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name. And as children of God, we will join in the praise of the one who has already come. We will praise him because he came with victory in his hand. The Bible says, your hand shall be on the necks of your enemies. We praise him because he came with peace and joy in his hand. Jesus said in John 16, 33, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So we praise him because he came with salvation in his hands. In that great text where Jesus started out in his ministry in, in, in Luke chapter 4, verse 16, he declares the ministry that he came to fulfill. Verse 16 says, so he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it again to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all those who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. If you find yourself gathered among the poor, Christ came for you. Christ came for you. The, the gospel was meant for you. You just need to realize that though you may be poor, your father is rich in houses and land. The cattle on a thousand hills belong to him. You just need to call on him and he'll supply your every need. He 
even knows what you need before you ask him, but you need to ask him. Make up your mind to trust God, not just to try God. Too many people have in their mind that they're going to try God when everything else fails. But that doesn't allow you to get God's best. The way you get God's best is you just need to trust God from the very beginning. Don't try him. Trust him from the start, and he will see you to the end. If you find yourself gathered among the brokenhearted, Christ came for you. There are many things that will break your heart in this life. Your friends, your family, the status of your job, the condition of your health. All these things are potential heartbreakers. But the Lord said he was sent to heal the brokenhearted. So if your heart has been broken, you need to seek the Lord because he came for you. If you find yourself among the captives, Christ came for you. If you are shackled to sin that you cannot turn loose and bound to habits that will not turn you loose, then you need to seek the Lord. He came for you. If you find yourself among the blind, Christ came for you. If you're in trouble and you cannot see your way out, Christ came to give you back your sight and he will see you through. Christ came for you. If you find yourself among the oppressed, Christ came for you. If you're surrounded by circumstances and situations in your life that have burdened your heart and troubled your mind, Christ came for you. And he invites you to come to him and lay your burdens down. He said in Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor in a heavy laden, and I, I will give you rest. So the shallow that Israel's waiting on has already come. And when he came, he provided for our deliverance as well. Christ came to provide your deliverance, and he's already accomplished it. It's already an accomplished fact. You just need to join hands with him and take part in your deliverance. You just need to praise him and receive your deliverance by faith. But Jesus Christ is still the coming one because he's coming again. He's coming again. And as children of God, we praise him because of what he has accomplished when he came the first time. And also as children of God, we will praise the Messiah when he comes again. The coming one has praises to receive and he's worthy of all our praises. We just need to wait on him and praise his name. But if we look at the text, we find that there's another reason that we need to wait on Shiloh, the coming one. Look at verse 9, which describes the Lion of Judah that's coming. Verse 9 says, Judah is a lion's whip. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down. He lays down as a lion. And as a lion, who shall rouse him? We need to hold on because Shiloh is coming to protect God's people. He's coming to protect the people of God. Jacob was drawing the picture for his sons of a lion who has just devoured his prey and is resting before he wakes up to go on the hunt again. And he asked the question, who wants to be the one who wakes up that sleeping lion? When a lion wakes up and returns to the hunt, he's a force to be reckoned with. The Messiah who came, came as a lamb to be sacrificed. He laid down his life as a sacrifice for all. He did it willingly and he did it peacefully. And the Lord himself declared that no one could take his life, but he gave it up by his own power. He laid down as a lamb, but he got up as a lion. When he rose from the grave on that first Easter morning, he declared that all power, all power in heaven and earth was in his hands. And that declaration made the disciples rejoice and should make us rejoice also. They rejoiced and we should rejoice because by that statement that Jesus had all powers in his hand, that meant that he had the power to bring, pass, bring to pass all the other statements that he had made during his ministry. He had the power. The fact that he was able to rise from the dead, that proved that everything that he had said all during that time. That's why we go back to the Bible and look at the things that Jesus said because he validated that he had power from heaven to make the things that he said come to pass. It means he had the power to keep the promise he made about protecting his sheep. In John chapter 10, verse 27, he said, My sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. It means that he has the power to save, the power to keep, the power to protect his own. And it means that he had the power to keep the promise that he made about standing with us forever. In Matthew 28, 20, he says, Lord, I'm with you always, even until the end of the age, the end of the world. 
He'll be standing right there with us, protecting us, guiding us, comforting us, teaching us. So we should rejoice that the one who came with power is coming again. Because Jesus came, we don't have to face this world alone. Because he came with power, it means that we don't have to wonder how things are going to turn out. We don't have to worry about how things are going to come out. That's already been decided. This life, this world, is a great battleground of the war between good and evil. And the winners and losers have already been determined. You just need to decide which side you're going to line up with. That's the only decision. Which side are you going to line up? The winners have already been determined. It's not a matter of whether God's going to win or Satan. God's already won. You just need to decide in this life where you're going to find up. It's just like if you have a videotape and you know what the end is going to be. If you, have, you, know, you know, we used to watch the Packers game. They used to have a, 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 a delayed record. They, they recorded it. They play on Saturday and they show it on Sunday with a tape. And some people didn't know it. And some people were betting on a game that had already been determined and betting the wrong way. <laughs> so, and that's what you do if you walk away from God. You're betting on a game that's already been won. God has already won the victory. God gave us a verse in his word to reassure us when we're faced with the temptation to give up, to get overwhelmed. He gave us this word just to hold on to. And that's 1 Corinthians 10, 13. He says, no temptation has overtaken you as such, such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. And with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Every temptation that comes upon you, God has a way for you to walk out of that without failing. You just need to believe God, trust God, and look for that way out that God is going to provide for you. It says, God is faithful. Wait on him. God is faithful. Hold on till help comes. So if you can believe that, you'll be able to face this life with faith and not fear. If you believe that God is going to provide for you, you'll be wait, looking for God's provision, and you can walk with faith and not fear. Jesus came the first time as the Lamb of God, offered as a sacrifice. He's coming again as the Lion of Judah, coming to claim God's victory. The coming one has the power to protect. And as children of God, we are protected by the coming Messiah. So we just need to trust the Lord, to wait on him, to wait on him. But it's not just because the Lord came with praise and power that we should wait on him. There's more. If you look at the text, you'll find that there is yet another reason that we need to wait on the coming one. Verse 10 describes the royal nature of the one who is coming. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. We need to hold on because Shiloh is coming to fulfill all of God's promises, to fulfill God's promises. Jacob declared to his sons that the king that would rule over Israel would come from the tribe of Judah. And that was a prophecy because Jacob spoke 1900 years before Christ was born. And that prophecy has been fulfilled. Christ came and fulfilled that promise. Seventy years after Christ was born, the temple was destroyed by the Romans, and the nation of Israel was scattered to the far corners of the earth. So from the year 70 A.D. to the year 1948 A.D., there was no nation on earth called Israel. There was no Israel until 1948. Preachers who preached about Israel before 1948 were preaching about a nation that had not been around for 1,900 years. But in the year of our Lord, 1948, because of the persecution of Nazi Europe, God gathered the Jewish people from all over the earth and restored them back into the land that he gave to, to, to Abraham 4,000 years earlier. The prophecies of God are sure, no matter how long it takes. God restored that nation back to the land that he originally gave them. And why? Why should, would Israel be restored back into the land after all those years? Well, I can tell you why. Because Shiloh is coming back again. Shiloh is coming back, and when he comes back, the Bible says he's going to come back to Israel. So Israel was established there, and we're waiting on Shiloh to come back again. All of the promises that God made will be fulfilled when Christ comes back again. He's coming back to fulfill the promises of God, so we should rejoice that Shiloh is coming back again. Because now we're included in all of the promises that Jesus is coming back to restore. We're part of the reason for Shiloh's return. There were some promises that the Lord made to those of us uh, that were not part of Israel. The promise he made to his disciples are the promises to you and I. 
And he made a promise in John chapter 14, verse 2, when he said, In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. He's coming back again to fulfill that promise. He made a promise that he would judge between good and evil. And he told us to learn how to turn the other cheek because vengeance belonged to him. He said that one day he would settle the score of, uh, uh, among all the evil that's gone on in this world. He said, I'm going to take care of that. You just, you just wait on me. Shiloh's coming back again, so we need to hold on till Shiloh comes. We need to hold on to the things that Christ left for us to do until Christ comes back and receives us to himself. He left us the command to love God with all our heart and soul and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Now, if we cannot love, his coming back would not be a joy for us. We won't be glad to see him if we don't know how to love when he gets here. In fact, before he gets here. But if we hold on to the love of Christ and, and, and hold on to the love that he sh had told us to demonstrate to our fellow man, then when Shiloh comes, we'll hear those beautiful words from the Lord. Well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your love. So we need to hold on because Shiloh is coming back again, and he has promised to fulfill all of God's promises to the faithful of God. We need to hold on to his back. And so now we return to the question with which we began. Why should we still be waiting for Shiloh since he's already come 2,000 years ago? We need to wait on him because he's promised to bless us if we just praise his name. We need to wait on him because he's promised to stand by us all the days of our life and on into eternity. We need to wait on him because he's, he has more promises to fulfill for the faithful of God. This ministry that we're in right here began 19 years ago, and we're still on the battlefield. Some of us who started out have been called home to glory, and they are in the bosom of Shiloh already. The rest of us need to hold on till Shiloh comes. Some who started out with us went off in different directions, and we, we still pray for them. But the rest of us need to hold on till Shiloh comes. More have come along and joined us along the way, and we, we thank God for you. Now all of us together need to hold on till Shiloh comes. If there's a battle going on in your life, and we're all battling something, you need to hold on till shallow comes into your life. If you're battling weakness in your life and it seems like you're losing ground, hold on till shallow comes. If you're battling stress in your life and, and your life seems to be coming apart, hold on till shallow comes. If you're battling pain, hold on till shallow comes. If you're battling worry and doubt, hold on until shallow comes. If you're battling people that just won't give you any peace, Hold on till Shiloh comes. I'm going to wait on the Lord because I want to hear those words when my Shiloh comes and says, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'm going to make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. I'm going to wait on him because I don't have to wait for him. Even though he's gone, he's still with me. Even though he's coming back, he's really never left me. I heard him say the other day that I'll be with you always, even until the end of the age. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. And just as he promised, he has sent the Holy Spirit to keep and to comfort me. And what a comfort he is. Sometimes I feel discouraged, and I feel my works in vain. But then the Holy Spirit revives my soul again. I know there is a bomb in Gilead. And I'm going to hold on till Shiloh comes. I'm going to wait on him because he promised to come back and to get me. So I'm going to wait on him. I know he's coming back to comfort me. When times get hard, I know he's coming back. I'm sometimes up and I'm sometimes down. But still, my soul is heaven bound. So he's coming to carry me home. So therefore, I'm going to wait on him. I'm going to wait. I'm going to hold on till Shiloh comes. That's what I'm going to do. What about you? What about you? Let's stand as we all gather together in song, as the choir leads us. <laughs>